all here this evening for when the blue death plagued Montana, remembering the 1918 influenza pandemic. So I'm going to give you all just a few more seconds to kind of settle yourselves up here. About a year ago, Father Beretta said to me, I think this uh, would be really great if we did something to honor the flu of 1918. And I thought it would be a really marvelous opportunity for us to acknowledge all of those lives lost and all of those people who suffered from this terrible virus. I hope when we end tonight that we all will remember that we should never take our good health for granted, and God bless vaccines. So, I'm so pleased to share the stage this evening with these two gentlemen. They're great assets to our community. They both provide essential services to the community. They take care of our health and our minds and our spirits. I'm going to open this evening with Father Patrick Beretta. Father Beretta was born in Paris, educated in France, Ireland, and Italy. He spent most of his adult life in Southern California. On an evening like this, I'm sure he had this. <laughs> Currently, he serves as the parish priest at St. Patrick's, the Immaculate Conception, and he is the chaplain at St. James Healthcare and Montana Tech. He's a gifted writer and a speaker, and he has many titles to his bibliography. This evening, he will present Terror and Grief in Butte, the human drama and emotional landscape of an epi epidemic. Please welcome Father Patrick Perrette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, very much. Can you all hear me? Great fears of the sickness have arrived in the city. I heard that two or three houses are already shut up. Lord, how empty the streets are and there is melancholy everywhere. I see some poor sick people in the streets. I hear so many sad stories as I walk by. Everybody talking of this person dead and this other person sick and so many in this family and so many in that. May God preserve us all. This is a very brief excerpt of the great, great account by Samuel Pipps, who is the greatest diarist in the English language of the plague of London of 1665. And every time you survey a place that experienced an epidemic, you're going to see in common helplessness, hopelessness, terror, grief, anxiety, <laughs> melancholy, and resignation. And Samuel Pepys captures those perfectly. But every community also experiences epidemic in very specific ways. So what is specific about Butte 1918? It's a young population. It's a male population. A lot of recent immigrants. And culturally, it's a population that is very, very social. What is intriguing about influenza is that it can become a nimble, an opportunistic killer, a very effective killer. And through the next, the story that I'm going to tell you, you will see how influenza took advantage systematically of these four specific groups to inflict unimaginable loss of life to the community of views. So when you tell the turbulent and rich and fascinating and colorful epic of Butte, some of the saddest verses of that epic are dedicated 
to the influenza pandemic of 1918. It also was a fierce epidemic that inspired the great, inspired the great poet John Donne with the immortal words, never send to know for whom the death the bell tolls. In the fall of 1918, the bells tolled for the people of Fute, and this is their story. October 24th, 1918 was a cold and gloomy day. And at 307 West Granite, outside of the residence, a very large crowd had gathered. And they had gathered around three hearses, <coughs> one for Mr. John O'Mara, one for his wife Sarah, and one for their daughter Sadie. And their destination was a common funeral at St. Patrick's Church. It was a loved family. It was a respected family, and crowds had come to honor them. When the remains were brought from inside the house and placed into the hearses, the police moved in, dispersed the crowd, followed the procession to the church, made sure that only the immediate family could attend the mass, made sure the doors were locked, and moved on. And as tragic as their experiences of the flu is, this is a common recurrence in the flu of 1918 is when you shared a roof with somebody who was sick, your risk for you were enormous. And so Patrick Sullivan of Centerville and his sons Peter and Michael died within a week. Marco Petievich and his daughter Danica died on the same day. So did Daniel Shidi and his son Danny. So did Annie Skubitz and her son Leo both died on Halloween. The sisters Frances and Rose McLaughlin died two days apart. And there was an amazing young couple from Norway that just arrived. They were strong. They were unbelievably healthy. And they both died. She died the day of his funeral. If you look at what happened over the country, the immigrant population was target number one and maybe Dr. Pullman can explain to us why maybe they had less immunity than the American population, but the neighborhoods with most immigrants in this town were target number one. Corktown, Dublin Gulch, Centerville, Fintown. People lived in crowded homes. The single people lived in crowded boarding houses, and they were prime victims. Fred Metz and his son, and daughter-in-law Nelly died at St. James Healthcare in 24 hours. Tim, Sarah Downey, and their two children were all swept by, swept by the flu in December and January. And then there's the amazing story of Little Wayne. Little Wayne was born in 1913. At the time of the fall of the flu, he was five years old. His parents had immigrated from Herzegovina, and they were Serbian. And the flu hit them very, very tragically. He first lost his little brother, and then his dad. And then to protect him, when the mom started feeling sick, she placed him in a room by himself in the house, and she forbid him to go anywhere and stay in that room for his protection. But to reassure him, the kid was only five years old, she kept talking through him to the door. And then he heard silence. He heard nothing. And he waited. He had promised his mom he wouldn't leave. But then he opened the door, and he found his mother dead. What was to mark him for his entire life with her face turned completely blue. That's why we called this evening with the blue death of Lake Montana. Dr. Pullman will explain to us what happens that the skin turns blue with the silvers. So his uncle comes to take little Wayne and takes him back to Herzegovina, where they make him work as a child, as a shepherd, 
and he sleeps on the floor for 10 years looking after the goats and the sheep. And in the winter when it's freezing, the only source of heat that, is had, that he has is to sleep close enough to the goats. At 15, they give little Wayne his relatives, his Serbian relatives, three options. To study for the church, to study for the military, or to go back to his godfather in Los Angeles. And he says, I want to go back to the United States. And so they had no money. They paid for his travel. <coughs> they had no money to give him to eat, so they gave him a big smoked leg of goat and a big chunk of cheese. And that had to last him until he arrived in LA. He was an immensely bright child. He studied, he became a very renowned professor at Stanford. They were the greatest historians they ever had. And there is a very famous scholarship named after him. He told his daughter, that he was never able to shake from his mind the blue face of his mother, never, that kept haunting him for the rest of his life. Let's go back to West Granite. The fierce epidemic had taken a hold of Butte and was gripping onto it very tightly. The first notice of it came in late September 1918. There is a very brief mention by a nurse in Missoula, and she writes this, an epidemic is having terrible effects at the university here, where our youth have been gathered to receive military training. On the 28th of September, six fellows who had just arrived from military training in the Midwest all showed sign of the flu. In the Anaconda standard, uh, the 5th of October, you can read this. Butte has so far escaped the ravages of Spanish influenza. And Dr. McCarthy, <coughs> county health officer, said last night that in spite, in spite of constant rumors being circulated, no confirmed case has been reported. Now, Alan, when I read this, I said it has to be a mistake because I find very hard to believe there would be constant rumors in Butte. <laughs> the following day, the 6th of October, the first case of the flu is reported in town. And so the Board of Health starts meeting starting the 9th of October, and they would meet every day to try to control the epidemic until mid. December. First measure they took, asking the physicians to report their cases of flu. And then they announced Spanish influenza to the population of Butte is infectious, contagious, communicable, and extremely dangerous to public health. All over the city, porters, uh, posters were placed and posted that really gave a sense to people what to do to avoid getting sick and what to do when you got sick. And to be honest with you, doctor, I read the list and this is pretty similar to what we would advise people to do nowadays. On the 11th of October came the big measure that shocked people. The health board orders the closure of, of churches, theaters, movie picture shows, dance halls, parades, cabarets, and schools. And the initial reaction to this was, this is too much. This is an overreaction. And that was the first phase of how Butte responded to the flu. It was complacent, and it was a little bit naive. The last night of the Rialto Theater that they performed, they showed movie before the closure, they kind of joked about it. They placed on their big screen at the end of the last show, they placed these words, hark, hark, the dogs do bark, the flu is coming to town, we'll close the shows until it goes, said the health board. And the Rialto was the most popular movie house in town at the corner of Park and Main. But it didn't last very long. 
because they had hired a fellow from New York, a fellow by the name of Henry Spadden. He was a nationally famous organ builder, and he was there to repair their organ. And he was one of the first victims of the flu in Butte. On the 12th of October, a very anticipated central football game is canceled at the Columbia Gardens. In the newspaper on the 14th of October, you can read an article under the headline, Unique History Made in Butte. For the first time since Butte became a mining center, there were no church services yesterday. The doors of every Catholic and Protestant churches were closed, and instead of singing, there was complete silence. I have to tell you that I've learned a lot. I talked about the diary of Samuel Pepys. The diary of Butte in those days are the newspaper articles and, and through uh, Mrs. Crane and uh, Tracy Thornton at the Standard, I was able to, uh, uh, to really use those for this, for this talk. So there was a huge contradiction, there was a huge paradox. People noticed that schools and dance halls and churches were closed, but what about the bars? What about the saloons? Well, they didn't have to close. They had to make a few adjustments. They had to remove their card tables. They had to make sure that not too many people would come and gather. But a reporter was a little shocked at this, and he went to the mayor of the time, a fellow by the name of William Maloney, and he said, Mayor Maloney, can you justify closing school and churches and not saloons? And he says, yes, I can. He says, because and this is a gem. He must have been a philosopher and a scientist. <laughs> this is a gem. He said, because reasonable consumption of alcohol is actually much better than too much medicine. <laughs> Do they still teach this in medical school? <laughs> Two ministers went to the next Board of Health meeting and they said, since you closed our churches, they were Lutheran and Methodist, since you closed our churches and you didn't close the bars, we ask for your permission to go and preach in the bars from now on. <laughs> so the first phase was a phase of defiance. Um, and for two reasons. First of all, people thought that they were way overreacting. They hadn't come to realize the danger. But also, Butte, with very large ethnic populations, needed place to feel at home, needed place to belong. The church was one of these places. The bars were one of these places. And Butte is a very, very social town. This is a place where we celebrate together, and this is a place where we grieve together. And to be, able to be separated from people at a time that was so difficult, it was inconceivable for the population of Butte. Give you an example. My first winter in Butte, when I was still at St. John, I remember on very, very cold morning, where it was completely dark and early, and right after Mass, I would hear people outside talk and laugh for 20, 25 minutes. I said, my goodness, this is a social town. <laughs> And so people really resented those measures. And the Board of Health was attacked, was ridiculed, was in many ways uh, defied against. But these men were heroes in many ways. They were very courageous to stay because I think that a lot of these situations were important. Next measure, all the bargain sales were forbidden from every store. Stores are to fumigate every night, and the staff had to wear masks. Mrs. Crane told me a beautiful story, sad story, about her great aunt, great grand aunt, who owned, Margaret Sloan owned Sloan's Grocery in what is now the Goodwill Tavern. And in her store, she had one of the only telephones in Butte, and she remembered those dark days, those tragic days, she would say they would be family coming and place a phone call to the doctor. And then maybe within hours, 
they would come back and place a phone call to the priest. And then maybe hours later, they would come and place a phone call to the mortuary. The masks became a visual symbol of the epidemic, those glazed masks that people had to wear, that were entirely ineffective, of course, but people had to wear them. And they went to ask um, a young lady who was a server, because they didn't close the restaurants, people had to eat. And she had to wear the mask, like all the other servers in her restaurant, and they asked her, what is it like to work with a mask all the time? And she had this great answer, she said, well, my makeup becomes all mixed up with the medicated dope contained in the mask, and our facial charm, charms are hidden from public view. <laughs> Essentially, what she, said to, what she said is, how do you expect me to work when people don't even know how pretty I am? <laughs> that is confidence mute style. <laughs> then she continues, every few minutes, one of us dock in the alley for air, but we take the order good naturally for we are willing to do our utmost in helping to prevent the spread of the epidemic. 22nd of October, Rex and Hot Springs are shut down. In the paper on the, t on the 24th of October, you can read, to find a place to care for the increasing number of influenza patients, city and county authorities decided last night to take over the Washington Junior High School on Granite and Arizona streets and turn it into a temporary hospital. That's where the Lexington Gardens are today. There is no more room in any of the Butte hospitals for patients. Yesterday, there were 22 reported deaths and 246 new cases, and the list is incomplete because many doctors are still not reporting their cases. Physicians were exhausted. Physicians were so overworked. I think that they are among the great, great heroes of those days. And I cannot even imagine the <coughs> pressures put on them looking after their patients, being emotionally involved in the loss of their patients, the suffering of their patients, and still every night before going to bed, writing reports about what they saw during the day. On the same day, James Finland, proprietor of the best hotel in town, offered to the authorities to turn in his entire establishment for the care of the flu patients. In this first phase, where people were complacent, the police decided not to be cooperative. They didn't think all these measures were justified. And so they dragged their feet in enforcing them. The Board of Health really struggled with them. And then they really became much more forceful and they ordered the sheriff to use all means at his disposal to enforce the closures. So on the 28th of October, you have the first arrests on the 29th of October, six men were charged with violating the orders of the Board of Health as they were gathered together to drink and to play cards. They were allowed to drink, they were not allowed to play cards. Don't ask me to explain that. <laughs> that was at a bar at 250 East Park, and they were all fined $10 each, which was a very substantial sum of money in those days. On the 2nd of November, the owner of a saloon, James Mullen, was arrested for completely disregarding the measures. He was asking people to play cards, and he was serving all kinds of drinks, big congregation, and he was brought in front of the board. Mayor Maloney accused the, the police of systematically protecting the saloons. And so you wonder, why were they not more cooperative? Well, there's a number of reasons. The economic impact of these closures was enormous. A lot of these people were their friends. And they also were in denial about the severity of what was happening to them. On Halloween night, 1918, they decided to remove the troops, the US troops, from the streets and bring them back in their barracks to give barracks and to give people a break. And immediately, <coughs> the saloons used that to break all the rules of the measures. On the 5th of November, remember what we did on Tuesday, vote for the midterms? 
That's what they did the 5th of November in Butte of 1918. They voted for their myth, just like us. Some office holders, a senator, U.S. senator, and uh, a, uh, a congressman. And it took place with that incident. And what strikes me, I was, I was studying the coverage of this in the newspaper. Now, remind, you know, we have to more remind ourselves there was a world war and a terrible epidemic. But the coverage was tiny of those midterm elections. And I would say, hello. <laughs> Fourth of November, Anaconda Standard. There is still a great demand for nurses in Butte. The Red Cross Hospital is in dire need of nurses. Many are either sick or completely exhausted as the result of enormous effort they have come forth to combat the malady. <coughs> so the nurses started to suffer dramatically of what they have to do to carry for people who are very, very contagious. Read in the paper on the 28th of October. Miss Blanche Cook, 22 years old, a very devoted nurse at Mary Hospital, died last night, victim of her heroic attention to her patients. After she was taken ill, she made a brave fight for her life but to no avail. So they were panicking about the shortage of nurses. Dr. Freund, who was from the county health office, then decided that since the schools were closed, that the thing to do was ask the teachers who had nothing to do to be trained to be nurses. And so they brought all these people to start helping the nurses in hospital. And what was happening to nurses started to happen to the teachers. Example from the buttes from the and a common standard. Sister of Charity Anne Bernard, age 25, died yesterday morning after a brief illness due to influenza. She was a teacher at St. Lawrence, and when the schools closed on account of the epidemic, she entered the work of caring for the sick at St. James Hospital, and while nursing the influenza patient, she contracted the disease. She was a very, very, gifted teacher, teacher. Now because of these measures, you see at the beginning of November, the first dip in the number of cases. People finally were doing what they were told to do, and you see the first dip in the number of cases that were disclosed every day. And so the board came under huge pressure from the business owners from the mayor, from the priest, from the ministers, from the school principals, reopen everything. And so they make the enormous mistake of bending to the pressure. And on the 8th of November, exactly 100 years ago tonight, the board gathered and declared that everything could resume as normal except for the school. It was a mistake with tragic consequences. Because three days later, when the war was over on the 11th of November, you became a scene of incredible drunken celebration and revel. People were dancing on the street, and laughing and rejoicing and singing. And the result was immediate. It reignited the blaze of the flu right away, and it became exploded again. Let me show you the progression just in a few days. On the 10th of November, you had eight new cases. On the 12th, 44. On the 14th, 92. <coughs> On the 16th, you're back to hundreds. So the first phase was complacency. The second phase was tragic. It was gloom. It was terror. It was anxiety. It was panic. People were terrified. They also asked that all people who were sick and living in a home where somebody was sick would stay in the house. 
they were quarantined, they were not allowed to get out. They would put signs on their door saying that nobody could walk in. But when we are, Helen, Ellen and I spoke about this today, when you belong to a tradition, when you're very sensitive to the suffering of others, and you have your neighbors, your friends, your relatives who experience a death or a sickness, it is so difficult not to go and comfort them and extend our sympathy. And so people really, really have a hard time abiding to them. And so what the board does is that it thought it was time to enforce it. Newspaper, 25th of October. This morning, six men from the mines will start placarding, placarding the houses in which influenza exists. Among their duties will be the task of seeing that quarantine regulations are observed. Health authorities declare that these men will have the backing of the health department in prosecuting violators. People in Butte call them the contagion gods. Now, some think there's a bit of a mystery. There are several mysteries, particularly scientific mysteries, about this epidemic. But one of the great mysteries is that even though the economic activity of the town was crippled, the mining industry shows absolutely no effect at all. They were not at all affected in terms of their production. The myth that came out of that is that for some reason miners were protected. They were not as sick as the EFD. Other, the general population. I spent a lot of time with newspaper articles, and the number of miners who died of the flu is staggering. And so I think we can put to rest the myth that miners were not affected, but somehow the mines were able to keep going without it being, being affected by the loss of so many miners. What breaks my heart the most about this topic is the fact that most of the victims of this terrible illness were young people. They were young people. They were people who had their entire lives ahead. In the current pattern, there are people in their 70s and 80s and 90s who died of the flu. Very sad, but very different. Very different. Some example, all from November. Newspaper notices, November of 1918. Edward Sullivan. The best known football player that View High ever turned out died at his home on Summit Street of influenza yesterday. He was 24 years old and a native of Butte. Sullivan, popularly called Harp, helped defeat the crack Englewood, Englewood High School team of Chicago. You guys were playing Chicago in those days. That's impressive. Miss <laughs> Bernice. Buried yesterday was one of Butte's, Butte's fairest and most popular young women. During her short life, she won an enviable place in the hearts of those with whom she came in contact. A lovable young woman, a great beauty, with a multitude of young male admirers. Edward Colville, a native of Missoula, only 17 years old, died at St. James Hospital yesterday following the visit of sick relatives in you. Heartbreak, heartbreak. On the 30th of October, the Board of Health and the City, Cam the city Council began to clash. They had a different opinion of what to do with the closures. And on one side, you had the mayor, and uh, the chief of police, and the sheriff, and five members of the city council. And the other side, you have the city attorney, the city physician, and five council members, and who wanted the bans to remain in force. It was one swing vote, and after a fierce, fierce debate, they finally voted six to five to remove all closure bans. But the health board was not ready for it, and they asked the help of the U.S. troops, the National Guards, and their own uniformed guards to continue to enforce it. Finally, about the early December, things started to dip for good, and it was the turn of the Board of Health to reopen the, some businesses on the 7th, 
On the 9th, the bars were permitted to start serving again. Some of them had never stopped really, but anyway, they were allowed officially to start serving again. And on the 12th, all the churches, theaters, dance hall, and places of amusement were allowed to reopen. It was another episode of the flu in 1919, January, little February, the fall, but nothing compared to what the city experienced in the fall of 1918. Last February, I went to the NCAP building. There is a lady here who, who remembers my significant visit there. And the NCAP building is, has a very intriguing uh, elegance about it. It's a very mysterious building. It's a beautiful building. Uh, designed by Charles Hare, who's a very gifted local uh, architect. And uh, it was built to be a poor farm, county poor farm hospital for the indigent, the elderly, the isolated, and the new immigrants. And when you think, think about the value of a society. If you think of the beauty of this building that was built for the most vulnerable and the poorest people in society at the time. Would we do that today? <coughs> Not even close. And so I went and I spent time and I was given a wonderful tour and then asked to be left alone. I wanted to be there where so many, so many people suffered, isolated. You know when you don't have your family around you, illness is much worse. They were quarantined, they were alone, and I wanted to spend time where they had suffered so much. You see if the walls and the ceilings and the floors were split. And uh, I paid my respect to them. It was a very, very moving moment. There is a marvelous story of heroes and told about a nurse that worked at the poor farm. It was told about her that young woman, we don't have her name, very healthy, amazingly dedicated, she came to work in the morning. By late morning, she wasn't feeling well, and she decided to stay at work. By mid-afternoon, she was sent home because she was getting very ill. And her colleagues heard later that same night that she had died. Incredible sacrifice of her young life for the cause of caring for the patients. That story is here all over the country. In July, I went to the Poor Farm Cemetery where these people were buried. And uh, erosion and neglect and vandalism and, and, and weather has made this place, it's very hard to, I couldn't find it. There was a couple walking their dogs and they very kindly took me to the place. But I walked in, it's a fenced area, and uh, spent a lot of time praying there. And the place cast really a spell of sadness, just to think that of all these poor people who lived anonymously also are laid to rest anonymously. Spent there, came by honor and, and tribute to them. Dear Mother, you will be glad to know that I have received an appointment in Butte City to a very good parish, St. Mary's on Main Street. It was a very big parish with five masses every Sunday, and all of them crowded. With these words begins an amazing correspondence between Patrick Brosnan, a young priest, and his family in Ireland, mostly his mother. Patrick Brosnan was born in Kilflin, a tiny little community in Kerry. He went to Thurlis to study to be a priest. He became a priest at 24 in 1916. Came straight to this country, and then they sent him to Helena, and the Bishop of Helena sent him to Butte. And it's marvelous to see Butte through his eyes, in the way he describes Butte to his mother. Dear mother, in Butte, the Irish run all the saloons. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> and themselves and their friends are their best customers. <laughs> the Irish do well in politics and business here. We have Mayor Maloney, Judge Lynch, and Sheriff O'Rourke, 
And Omera and McCarthy are very big merchants, which is our high here. Some 2,000 Irish boys came just within the last few weeks. I joined the Hibernians the other night, and I plan to join the Casey's soon. But there was oblique realism about his observations. He writes, this is a country at war, but you don't take any notice of the war here in Butte. Their own lives and the mines are so hard and so dangerous that they don't think very much of other things. The men die like dogs in the mine, copper burns their lungs out of them, and they get miners' con consumption. In June 1917, he writes to his mother, who had a very rough time in Butte recently. It was a big fire in one of the mines, and 193 men were smothered to death. It was not an Irish mine, but at the same time, there were a lot of Irish killed. We had 10 funerals at St. Mary's from this tragedy alone. It was a terrible time. And the men are on strike now, about 10,000 of them, and I hope that they win because the companies are hopeless tyrants in this country. Hoping Father, Judy, Dan, Jack, Larry, Tim, and Mary are all well, I remain your most affectionate son, Patrick. In one of his letters of September 1918, he makes anonymous, anonymous mention. Danny O'Neill, whom you know, Mother, had been sent to St. Brendan's Seminary when he developed the flu and he died at the age of 18 in New York City. He struck the people of this town, Father Brosnan, by his incredible love of the poor, particularly at the time of sickness. I'm going to tell you briefly a story that when I first came to Butte, one evening I get a call from a hospital in Dillon. And she said, we can't find our priest, and I think you may be the closest priest. She said, can you come and give the last rite to somebody? And uh, I said, uh, sure. And I said, now, I had a talk to give later that night, and it was supposed to be a terrible snowstorm during the night, and I had to give, uh, a, had a big funeral the next day. So I go to the parish lady, I thought she was going to say, I said, how far is this? I thought she was at three or four miles. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> so I panicked. I said, well, I have a talk to give. I have to in the morning. What's going to happen if I'm stuck over there? So I called Father Happy, and I couldn't get him. And then I called Father Burke, and I said, what do I do? He said, it's very simple what you do. You tell the people you cannot give the talk. You run to your car, and you rush them. Because there is no more sacred duty in your life as a priest than to be peace and comfort to the dying. It has liberated me and never worried about anything when somebody needed me. That's what Father Brosnan was famous for. His parish priest said to him, you're killing yourself. Are you out of your mind? But he kept doing it. He kept ignoring it. St. Helena Cathedral Rectory. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Brosnan, I feel it is my duty as one of St. of Pat's best and oldest friends to write to you and offer you my most sincere sympathy in your great sorrow. I received a call on Saturday evening, November the 9th, and I immediately went to Butte by the next train. Pat knew me and spoke my name immediately when he saw me. He told me that he felt terribly weak. But he spoke of Ireland, and friends and neighbors, and of his mother especially. And Pat hinted his regret at the lonely circumstances that forced him to die, far from all he loved in dear old Ireland. He gradually sank overnight and retained sporadic moments of consciousness until Sunday afternoon. When awake, he prayed. His nurse, at St. James was wonderful. She did all that was humanly possible to soothe the agony of his dying hours. Her most sincerely, of Peter Burning. Bishop Carroll, who was a wonderful man of great genius in many ways, came to do the funeral at St. Mary's because it was during that short window when you could still do the funeral in public. 
and he gave this most beautiful, stunning comedy about the power of humility of that priest. And when his pastor, Father Michael Hannon, was interviewed by the newspaper, simply there's no other way to call him, no other word to use, but that he was a saint. So Butte's experience of the flu is a story of terror and grief and courage and of love. And the greatest of these is love. Butte was a community of faith in 1918, and it was a community that was incomparably compassionate. And it had a landscape of emotion that was formed by deep, deep sensitivity to the sufferings of others. Earlier today, I went to St. Patrick's Cemetery. Donna Driver of Catholic Cemetery showed me uh, in both cemeteries where all these victims I'm talking about tonight were buried, or some of them. And I went to place flowers in front of uh, the Patrick Brosnan grave, and also at the grave of Sister Anne Bernard McChrystal. And I wanted to pay tribute to them and through them, to the physicians, and the nurses, and the people who sacrificed so much, the people who were vulnerable and suffering. And I spent quiet time there, and then I thanked them. I said to them, thank you. Thank you for showing that the power of love is stronger than the terror of an epidemic. Thank you for reminding us that there's no more noble gesture than comforting people when they are at their most vulnerable. And after it was time for the long process of healing, when Butte saying, how do we rebuild our lives after this much loss? The memory of the physicians and the nurses and people like Father Brosnan were the memories that gave reasons to the people of Butte to embrace their lives again. December 1918, the funeral services were held yesterday for Walter Mueller. The service, services were private owing to the regulations of the board. But many floral tributes were sent. Mrs. Mueller and her child were unable to appear, both of them being still very ill of influenza. But they recovered, and they recovered completely. And so bars slowly filled up with men and laughter and the occasional brawl. High school games started to be played again. People conquered their fears and went back to the movies. Young men took young women to dances. And on Sundays, music could be heard outside of churches again. Influenza entered Butte with formidable force. And it left very easy. At last, the epidemic was over. Thank you very much. is Dr. John Pullman. Dr. Pullman brings his considerable knowledge of infectious diseases to the podium this evening. Dr. Pullman is an internal medicine specialist at New Montana State. He practices in the Old St. James School of Nursing at 300 West Mercury Street. He received his medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, and he's been in practice for more than 40 years. Dr. Pullman is affiliated with St. James Healthcare and other medical institutions in Montana. Tonight, we are pleased to have Dr. Pullman talk to us about the science of influenza and pandemics. Dr. students, and I warned them yesterday, and I was over 
Miami students the microbiome, that when they start telling you you're smart, it's because you live long enough and you remember 10% of the things you screwed up. <laughs> so of course, can you hear Dr. Pullman? No. no. Oh. Want me to hold it for you? The technology. It's hard to believe Montana Tech doesn't have a little button. <laughs> Even restaurants have. I knew this would be a tough, tough talk to get to follow. In fact, I knew it was going to be good because my wife decided she might listen to me give a talk for the first time in 22 or 23 years. <laughs> she had to admit that this morning. And I knew who, who was attracted. So forgive me if this gets to be a bit dry. I'll try not to let that happen. And we'll talk about the influenza virus. So let's start at 10,000 feet and try to put it into context in terms of what kind of virus this is. There are many agents that cause respiratory viral infections. And without too much ado, the RNA viruses are the most vicious. And of all the RNA viruses that cause upper and lower respiratory tract infections, influenza is the most serious. The challenges for all these viruses, and especially influenza, is the short incubation period, days, person-to-person -person transmission, fomite transmission, which is with your finger, touch the, touch the surface of a desk, and for two days, if it has influenza virus, it's contagious, and if you pick it up and inadvertently touch your nose or your mouth, you, you've inoculated. So it isn't always coughing or being within three feet of someone, um, and so it makes it, these viruses uh, spread very quickly. And unfortunately, because of these RNA viruses, we don't have lasting immunity to almost any of them. Vaccinations are difficult. With influenza, we try every year, but it's not always perfect. Influenza spread around the globe, and there's a seasonal variation I'm sure you're all aware of, that it occurs in the fall and winter in the northern hemisphere and in the opposite seasons in the southern hemisphere. And the overlapping symptoms of these viral infections it makes it very difficult. Muscle aches and pains, fever, shortness of breath. You can have any, you can have a simple common cold with many of these symptoms. Or you can have influenza with just a few of these symptoms. What's missing from this, which drives me the most insane in practice, is trying to make patients understand that when you have diarrhea, you do not have them. <laughs> but everybody thinks they have the flu when they're vomiting, and they have other viruses. And it's a great misnomer because, you know, in this day and age, they expect to be treated for the flu. And some of these gut, gastrointestinal viruses just won't respond. We have nothing for them. And everybody is familiar with all the symptoms of the flu. Croup is parainfluenza, and why do they call that? Because it's like influenza, came through butte probably a month or two ago, and everybody was yours. That is a unique uh, tropism for this parainfluenza virus. And it doesn't put people in the hospital and they don't die. So viruses cause the majority of the pneumonias we have. And the viral pathogens are the majority the irony is, with all the science we have, if you present with pneumonia, we have a 40% chance if we throw the kitchen sink at you to make a diagnosis as to what organism this is. Now recently, with molecular assays, we can diagnose influenza a lot more quickly. It was a push, but it's even, it's even come to be. <laughs> These viruses have a seasonal uh, variation in the northern hemisphere, and this was in Seattle, Washington, mimicked what happened in Butte. Influenza appeared in early December and tapered off slowly over the next four and five months. And then RSV virus followed it quickly, which is a virus that affects children more than adults. 
And you may think, well, that's not very interesting. But I'm going to diverge from flu because it's going to get grim when we talk about the rest of the flu. RSV virus hit Newton, I think it was 1996 or 8. And what followed was a meningococcal meningitis outbreak. There were 11 patients here identified. The only one of the 11 that died was a five-year-old whose mother moved them to Nevada. All the rest were diagnosed and treated. The CDC came up and got parents to volunteer, and they swabbed the children that had RSV, and 70% of the kids in Butte, and they swabbed, I think, close to 100 kids, were carrying a meningitis bacteria, 70%. Influenza does the same thing. It strips your respiratory tract of its immune protection, and it sets you up for other bacterial infections that can be devastating. We now diagnose it with molecular assays, swabbing the nose. You can culture it. It's expensive. Nobody does it anymore. Corporate medicine doesn't allow that anywhere in the country. You can get serology, but by that time, you're either dead or you're better, and nobody cares. <laughs> So there are three major types of influenza, and A has the greatest virulence, C is very uncommon. And they're named for the type and place, year of isolation, and then they use this bizarre, well, what seems to most people bizarre nomenclature of H1N1 or H3N2, and the hemagglutin is just a receptor on the envelope of the virus that's unique to probably 15 to 17 different strains, and then the neuraminidase has another dozen or so. And this envelope that you see around this virus with the receptors on the surface has RNA uh, molecules that are in separate bites, and they are constantly mutating. They mutate. There's a mutation in each strand of RNA, of which there are many, probably 10 to the 6 times every 2 days to 3 days. They're insanely mutable, and most of the time, they're a bust. They don't create anything threatening. The neuraminidase is an important one because it allows release from the whole cells, and there are antivirals that block that, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. What happens to influenza A is these mutations, as insane as they are, aren't very successful. It really is a bust, but it has nowhere else to go and has all the time in the world. And we'll talk about where that happens and why it affects people. But usually the flu, that, uh, the strains of flu that we see shift very slowly one year to the next. So if you've been vaccinated or exposed in the last 20 years fairly frequently, it's very unusual to get terribly ill with it. It doesn't keep you from getting it, but it keeps you from becoming seriously ill and it reduces mortality. And this variability can change dramatically, and it does about every eight to 10 years with a major reassortment of these RNA genome bits. And they uh, can be uh, totally new to the population, in other words, you're immunologically naive. And there is a lot of thought that, and honestly, I, I don't know how they were able to go back and figure out what the influenza viruses were in 1880 to 1900. But it was an H6N7. There were numbers I had never heard of before. H1N1 or anything that was closely related to it was never, these kids that were 20 and 19, 17 had never been exposed to anything like it. And they were probably one of the most immunologically naive populations, age groups in the country at that time. So where do they live? Bird. Influenza, we're, we're terrible hosts. We either die or we figure out how to get vaccinated. I mean, the influenza virus doesn't persist in the human population. Where it lives very comfortably and rarely causes disease is in the wild bird population. Primarily migratory geese and ducks. And it spreads, the theory is, to domestic ducks 
and then it, it can spread to pigs. And pigs, it doesn't kill very much either, but it mutates very successfully. And it can spread from ducks to poultry. When there was an H5N1 outbreak, gosh, I'm trying to remember how far back that was, uh, 15 years ago or so in Hong Kong, you know what the answer was for that? That was the, the, and only, it could have only happened in the People's Republic of China. They killed every single duck, goose, and chicken in Hong Kong by the minute. They just found them up and killed them. There was no question. There was no argument. It couldn't happen. <clears throat> Monitoring the evolution of influenza viruses in pigs in the U.S. is very difficult. The CDC makes a great effort, but there's a huge economic push against that. They don't want their pork products to be associated with this being a source of this thing, but they are. It's quite uh, effective, and they aren't dying from it. It's the natural reservoir for these viruses. You know, we're a sideshow, believe it or not. We call it safety and chauvinism. We think this virus was designed just to screw with us. <laughs> and that's probably way too narcissistic. <laughs> and obviously it could go from pigs or poultry to humans. And we'll talk about that a little more because I think there's a fascinating thing about H1N1 that doesn't get talked about a lot. But the disease overall causes 15 to 20 percent of the global population to be infected, and up to half a million deaths. And I'm not going to put you through this too much of this, but if you look at this spread of how it appears in a community initially in that six week, eight week, three month period, the best single marker of the beginning of a true influenza epidemic isn't the markers that are tested, and the swabs that are done in the ER. It's a school absenteeism. And the health department knows that if you see school absenteeism spike to 10% or more, the odds are extremely good that it's going to be an influenza epidemic. And then it's followed by employee absenteeism, hospitalization, mortality, and if we're, and if we're lucky, there's no pandemic. So it's spread by surface contact, where it lives two days, or aerosol. And I love this picture. Every time I'm on an airplane, isn't there somebody coughing within three to four feet of you? I mean, why during the flu outbreak last year the airlines didn't give out masks? I still don't know. I considered it like an abrogation of public responsibility, but you know, I guess it would have cost too much. So what happens with flu? The abrupt onset is one of fever and headache, in particular, retroorbital eye pain. Your eye muscles are directly affected, often first, often before you have a fever. Your muscles ache, then on day two, three, and four, you get a sore throat, a runny nose, and a cough. What isn't there? You don't have diarrhea. <laughs> I can't tell you how misdirected it is. When I was a fellow, and I'm not going to tell you how far back it was, and I don't think it would be done now. We would get student volunteers and we would warehouse them for 10 to 14 days. We deliberately inoculate them with influenza. And then we would rinse their noses out every four to six hours and titrate the virus in tissue cultures. That's why they know precisely how long it takes you to be symptomatic, how long you're gonna be sick, how much you're gonna shed, and whether or not the drug at the time or an antibody was going to work. Turns out it did then, it doesn't now. The bugs mutated way past it. The other thing that those tests, those studies told us, because you know it's so hard to get patients into a study like that, is that you, when you feel like you're better and you want to get out of the locked ward that we had them in in the basement of the county hospital back in Rochester, <laughs> You couldn't go because you shed that virus for three more days after that. And that's, that, that's a tragic but integral part of how human populations are, are vulnerable and don't always, we don't isolate them long enough. So diagnostic strategies, I'm not going to bore you with this. The rapid nasal 
PCR polymerase chain reaction test is the best. Um, the antiviral treatments, oseltamivir was Tamiflu. The best it's been shown to do is reduce the incidence of fever by seven hours. <laughs> now, that's in large populations. Are there some populations who benefit more probably? There is a new drug now called um, Biloxivir, which is a completely different mechanism of action. It just got approved by the FDA. And you say, a phase two study, you know, they usually never approve a drug after a phase two study. It's supposed to be safety. They are in such a panic about having effect to flu drugs that they push this through. And so Biloxivir, we're gonna have a challenge from now on, even if it's priced reasonably. Because it turns out, in all the animal models we use, if you use Tamiflu and Biloxivir, it's three times more likely to be successful. Now, is that what it's approved for? No, it's approved for single use. But everybody with any science background that's read this literature or any of the research knows, if they're really sick, I don't know how we can avoid not prescribing both. If you're sick enough to be in the hospital, it's gonna, it's gonna go up against cost, it's gonna go on against corporate practice. But it's a challenge, I think. But at least it's a new drug. There's another new drug similar in its class that's being tested now. And St. James is part of that research, and it's under Janssen, but it's funded by BARDA, which is the biocare research organization in Washington, which has an easier purse strings than any other place in Washington. But with Janssen, and it just happens that St. James, at least for now, partly because the hospitals very good about encouraging research. We have the highest number of hospitalized patients treated with new food. Now that may change in a year, but I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the hospital. It's really good. So what is influenza pneumonia? It's when they get in and they're sick and they can't breathe and they have a low oxygen level. Primary influence of pneumonia can cause a rapid, uh, I'm trying not to sound too, too medical for this, but your lung become, your lung sacs become leaky and you develop edema in the lungs. It's called adult respiratory distress syndrome. So the worst cases, what we saw in 1918, what they saw, were young people that were getting sick and die within days, two or three days. We'll talk about why that happened and how how it might be how it's different now, even if we see a, uh, an organism like that. The other way they kill is with secondary pneumonias, with pneumococcal pneumonia, and what used to be influ amophilus influenza. Although most uh, most people under the age of 45 or 50 have been vaccinated for that, and staph aureus. Those are vicious pneumonias, and it used to be. You would get sick and you'd get better after three to four days and then, then the bacteria in the morning would follow it in five to seven days and you'd be in trouble. And the mortality rate of those is quite high. In children, it can be a severe issue respiratory wise, but when we were using aspirin for the fever, a lot of them developed encephalopathy called Ray syndrome and they died from fulminant liver failure. So aspirin is never used in the treatment of fever when influenza is suspected. Is there a vaccine? They try and match it to the wild type that they see in the southern hemisphere the six months before we see it. So it's a scramble every year, and they sometimes don't get it right. The vulnerable group groups are the very young, very old now, and patients with other risk factors that aren't too, uh, that are fairly intuitive, pregnant women in particular. I'm not going to argue or talk about vaccine types. It's an injection. The nasal type isn't encouraged often. Um, and there are multiple formulations. And again, it's not given to prevent infection. It's given to prevent the severe complication, which is a myth. I got the shot, and I still got the flu. I got the flu vaccine last year, and I still got it once a week. But I was out five days instead of 10 days. I mean, that's the best you can ask of what we have right now. What about H1N1? It shifted and it was deadly. It may have appeared in the late 1916, but 
clinically it appeared in 1917, and there were three deadly waves in 1918. And a lot of it was related to troop movement and concentration. The U.S. military at the beginning of 1918 had three to 400,000 troops. By the end of the year, there were four million troops. And a lot of them were crowded together, put into barracks during training, shipped on trains, put on boats, and shoulder to shoulder, and shipped. And every time they carried it over, it started, well, when they started to carry it over, it, it obviously caught on in Europe. We'll talk about where, uh, where how it did that in a little bit. But. The reason it's called the Spanish flu is because of the politics of the day. Spain was the only neutral country in North America and Europe. And they were willing to say it was a deadly epidemic. Every other country was denying it. They were afraid it would interfere with troops, enrollment, and uh, enlistment, and the draft. And it was strictly political. Woodrow Wilson was a brutal president. <laughs> he was the one that hired J. J. Edgar Hoover and started 40 years of horror in his FBI escapades. But he was part of the suppression in New York City and the East Coast, where a lot of the science was being looked at because it wasn't politically acceptable. They were afraid it was going to interfere with the troops enlisting and getting mobilized and the spirit of the war. They wanted you to buy war bonds. And they had war bond parties. And a lot of influenza across the country was spread at war bond parties. And Woodrow Wilson never quite admitted it. And he had some hacks in the bureaucracy of New York City Health Department and other East Coast cities that backed him up. And they would not do the isolation and the quarantine that happened in view very quickly. Each wave, there's a suspicion that this virus mutated. So between going to Europe and then pop, and a lot of troops were coming back, forth, back and forth. The mutagenicity was insane, and this, the third wave was the most deadly, and that was probably the strain that hit Butte at the end of 1918. Ironically, once everybody had been exposed, they still detected H1N1 for the next 50 years. But it wasn't doing anything. It wasn't part of even a, 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 an outbreak until 1976. And then it mutated. There can be muta some mutations in H1N1. So it became, the question is, was it a more benign virus or were we more immune? And maybe the immunity waned. But as soon as it hadn't been detected for 15 years, it was back causing serious disease. It reappeared again in 2008, 2009, and that was considered close to a, an epidemic. So what is it about H1N1? I find it fascinating. It colonizes migratory geese and ducks in North America, South America. Turns out, those migratory birds don't share pathways with the Asian, European, African migratory birds. They are separate populations. When they look at the subtypes of influenza virus that are colonized, not killing, there's a harmonious sort of symbiosis going on here. You can't find H1N1 in any Asian, African, or European virus, uh, migratory animal. The waterfowl migration, migration pathways in the US are fairly limited to these four, Pacific, Central, Mississippi. A lot of evidence points to the fact that H1N1 probably evolved and God forbid it was the potatoes or chickens in Kansas at a military barracks in Kansas. So we were the source of this. Should have been called the American group. But it wasn't politically acceptable. So Spain took the hit. <laughs> and they, li they deliberately propagated that, that it's endangering the prosecution of the war in Europe. And they finally started to agree with signs like this that it spreads by spinning, at least. I know, grudgingly, grudgingly did they come and put these kinds of signs up. And they would, when the soldiers or troops became ill, they would put them all in concentrated areas, which was the worst thing it could possibly do. Because if they had a secondary bacterial infection that every one of the rest of them were going to be vulnerable to, 
it just accelerated the secondary infections. It was brutal. And what's interesting in this picture isn't just the crowding, it's what's not here. I mean, just consider this a hospital. What don't you see in this picture? There's two things you don't see. You don't see IV fluids being given because the production of hollow bore needles was by hand up until the 40s, 50s. There was no mass production of hollow bore needles that you could easily plug in to people and then give them fluids and throw it away. They were painstakingly manufactured in very short supply. What else is missing? Somebody said oxygen. They had no oxygen in these hospitals, in any hospital. They didn't understand that concept. So it was a deadly, co deadly, deadly combination of lack of resources, understanding, and we'll talk a little bit more, even an understanding of the germ theory. Again, this is the most fascinating thing to me, is there's no IV fluids. And they could give IV fluids, it's just they couldn't find the hollow bore needles. They were all being used in research in other limited areas. And there's no oxygen. Finally, you know, they started to agree with signs like this, and this was from Chicago, um, is that you need to cooperate by not coming if you're coughing or sneezing. We say that now. They should have said you just shouldn't come at all in a public gathering. Okay, I'm gonna rock through this, but why did they call it the blue death? I'm not sure there's an easy answer. The obvious answer is cyanosis is what your oxygen levels are so low, your hemoglobin literally is blue. And this is an example of it. But there are cases described of corpses all across the country that weren't just blue, they were black. Their skin was black. It's hard to imagine influenza alone doing that, but this is probably a start of what they were describing. And this is called purpurifulminans. And this is a massive uh, complication of sepsis, which is usually from a secondary bacterial infection, like pneumococcal pneumonia or meningococcal pneumonia or meningococcal meningitis. And this is virtually always associated with multiple organ failure and death, even now. It's almost impossible to treat this still. There's just some more examples of purpurifulminans. And I think somewhere between here and there, the cyanosis that you see without enough oxygen, because nobody was getting oxygen. And the necrosis of the skin caused by the coagulopathy, coagulopathy that occurs with severe sepsis. Your immune system has totally failed at this point and whole bodies would be blue. In Montana, the influenza rates, it was remarkable. If you look at the number of deaths in Montana, over a two week, they, this is over September through June, 1918 to, uh, September 1918, June of 1919. And then they compare it to 1928, 1929, 10 years later. And you can see what a marked difference there was in incidence and the number of deaths due to the influenza. But this is an entry. I hate anything with more than four points in the slide, so <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you to focus on anything but the age group 25 to 34. This is 1918, 1919. The census in view that time was 102, close to 102,000 people. 1,600 of the people that died were between the ages of 25 and 34. It's an astonishing, and if you go over to 28, 29, for the next outbreak of influenza, there are only 37. Despite the fact the population had already shrunk to 30 lost people. But that unique vulnerability made that outbreak very unusual. My grandfather was a physician in Brooklyn, New York, during this epidemic. And the thing that struck him the most wasn't just the healthy young people were getting it, but he had a strong suspicion, and it's really hard to tease it out now, that it was muscular young men and pregnant women who were the worst. And you'll notice in these death rates, nobody talks about pregnancy, morbidity, mortality. They don't talk about how many pregnant women 
they were so used to childhood mortality for other reasons that they didn't even bother to keep it as a separate metric. That's where Peter Pan came from. So let's talk about what the doctors, and I apologize probably for, for this, but I'm afraid as physicians, and this wasn't just in Butte, this was all across the country, even Johns Hopkins, they were still doing things that didn't quite match up with the germ theory. And they would perform venesection, which is a fancy word for bleeding. And they literally did that. They thought they were bleeding out the evil human. And so even, even the physicians that were beginning to buy into the fact that it was an infectious disease, they still felt this was a way to treat a septic patient. And a lot of the morbidity and mortality, I hate to say it might have been from the attempts and good hearted, good, well meant attempts at bleeding out the evil humors. And so I'm gonna finish this so you can you have a chance to answer questions, but there was one physician in Butte who made the leap. And in 2007, Dr. Antonoli, who a lot of you know, asked the medical staff to donate money to resurrect the grave of the physician in Butte who had the most success by tenfold of any other physician in the, in the city because he never bled anybody and he used natural Chinese herbal medicine. That was so his grave is at the Mount Moriah Cemetery if you ever want to go. Because the sad story about Dr. Pak was that he was very successful, um, but then his, uh, his wife passed away in 1927, and he passed away shortly after that. And, he, and his son uh, died of opiate overdose. And his grave, he had no family members to, to mark his grave, so he had an unmarked grave for a long time. And then Dr. Agnoli, I don't know how he found it, got the collection together and got it marked. The interesting thing was, there aren't many Chinese graves in Butte at all. And if you've read Buried in Butte, you don't know why. There were tens of thousands of Chinese. But the Tong were tasked with digging up the bones in three to five years and shipping them back to their ancestral homes if you had the money. But his son had squandered the money from the family. And thus his grave is still in Mount Moriah, but no less important. Thank you.